and does not constitute medical advice, but feel free to ask your questions. If I can't answer it because I'm a nurse, but not your nurse, then um, we can direct you to some good resources. Um, but if you do have specific medical questions that you think only a provider could answer because of your own particular health history, definitely reach out. And if you need a healthcare provider, let us know and we can connect you to some folks on campus and in the community based on your needs. Um, we've had a couple of people reach out who are needed to the area and so we were able to connect them with um, the health center and be able to get them some good resources so definitely let us know if we can be of help so discussing everyday aches and pains and how we can relieve those or alleviate the symptoms um, is really important because as we age we tend to have more aches and pains but that does not mean that it is normal so what's common doesn't mean that it should be normal or expected um, so sometimes you know of course if you are aging and you know you have kind of um, more soreness or stiffness in the morning or more aches and pains um, sometimes that is just a part of everyday life right wear and tear um, but when it becomes more of a problem, we want to kind of address those. So we're going to talk about common reasons for those aches and pains. We're going to explore how to manage those pains well. And then we're going to talk about specific strategies to help, um, if not prevent the pain, alleviate it. So just because something is common doesn't mean it's normal, like I said. So we have to think about, you know, is this a normal sign or symptom of, of getting older? Um, or are we having an acute injury or illness that's caused the everyday ache or pain? Have we had a surgery? Um, have we had something kind of going on um, that would lead to that common, you know, reason for an ache or pain? Or is it something, um, you know, that we just don't have an answer for? It's more of a chronic thing. So we'll talk about both. So it's important to get a checkup. One of the ways that you can do that is through your annual physical exams, and that's really important. I think a lot of people didn't do those over the last few years because of the pandemic. Um, I know a lot of people were trying to limit their contacts in an office where people were mainly going in for COVID symptoms and things like that. So one of the things that I'm hearing and reading um, from colleagues and just in the literature is that um, we have to get people back in the routine of going for their annual physical exams. And I will raise my hand and say that I did not go to all of my annual exams during that two year period where it was really acute because um, I didn't want to have more exposures than I had to have. So um, if you're in that group, I'm in that group with you. My hand is raised. But this year I've been really intentional about scheduling all of those checkups. Um, so the first one would be with your primary health care provider, which is usually an MD, a medical doctor, but it could be with um, a physician's associate or it could be with a nurse practitioner. So definitely get in. One of the other things you can do is participate in our health screenings, like I mentioned earlier. Those will kick back uh, on in the later part of August. And you can come and get some just, you know, general first line screenings like your blood sugar, your blood pressure, your height, your weight, and your cholesterol. And that'll give you a few good numbers to kind of see where you are in terms of your health. We always say in health and wellness to know your numbers because you've got to have data to support kind of where you are with your health journey. Um, but you have so many other things that you also want to take care of. So they'll ask you questions about your health, your health behaviors, your goals. Um, and that'll be a good starter. You also can get a $50 gift card at the time of completion. So that's a nice bonus. Uh, and then that will let you know how soon you really need to make sure that you go follow up with that appointment with your physical exam, because if you have a high blood pressure, high blood sugar, high cholesterol, that's going to be more of an immediate need. So hopefully that really enticed you to go and sign up through your portal to come see us. So another thing is, is you can talk to your providers about what's best for you in terms of pain management, because sometimes you can take something like an over-the-counter medication like aspirin or, you know, Tylenol or something like that to relieve some of your aches and pains to get some relief. And if you've done that for more than a few days or a few weeks and you're not getting relief, then it's probably time to see a healthcare provider. You can schedule those routine exams and making sure that you're getting lab work or blood work done. Um, you have different parameters for how often you can get some lab work done, and it depends on your insurance policy plan. So for me personally, I have blood work done pretty regularly because I'm deficient in B vitamins and D vitamins, but our insurance will only cover for you to have those tests run um, for like routine screenings every six months or so. 
Uh, so that's important to know and to ask your provider, you know, when and how they can monitor your blood work if you do see something that's out of what we call the normal limits or if it's something that just needs to be monitored because you've had a history of maybe a low or high level. So that's good to know. Sometimes you'll get x-rays and tests that um, your provider deems appropriate. So once you reach a certain age, depending on the healthcare practice uh, or your risk factors, you'll start to have an annual uh, chest x-ray or you might have an uh, EKG to check on your heart function. Uh, so those tests usually don't start until after you're in your 40s or sometimes even, you know, 45, 50 in that range for your annual exams or unless you've had something that would cause you to be monitored more closely and um, more, you know, kind of under, um, you know, a surveillance type of protocol. And then you can talk about anything that you need to in terms of the, the common challenges you're having. So we call them activities of daily living or ADLs. And if the aches and pains that you're having are interfering with the things that you would normally do, it's interfering with your sleep or it's interfering with what you're able to lift or open or, uh, you know, maybe you're having a challenge with, uh, you know, being sedentary if you have a desk job, those kinds of things. If those aches and pains are interfering with your ADLs, then that's going to be a little bit more serious because that's really impacting your overall health and functioning. And so you want to mention that if it's an ache or pain that's so persistent that you're taking medications frequently without much relief or if you're not able to do your typical ADLs or it makes it harder or you may try to avoid those, you definitely wanna make sure your provider knows that. So some possible causes beyond just accidents, injuries, illness, surgeries could be stress. Dehydration is a huge one. I always like to tell y'all stories because I think that that makes it real. Um, you know, it's always helpful that you're learning information, in my view, from someone who understands who's been there. You know, I've had aches and pains. I still have aches and pains. Um, and so I'm right there with you trying to figure this out for myself and for my family. Um, so that's why I like to share my stories with you. It's not just textbook knowledge or, or reading scholarly journal articles, but it's really real life, you know. And so um, one thing that I learned recently that, you know, is not common knowledge, I think, um, that dehydration impacts so much more than just like our GI or health or like our overall organ function. Um, but people who have spinal injuries or who um, even just have arthritis in their spine, we're seeing that more and more. Um, that dehydration can actually make a huge difference in the pain levels of people who have spine issues. Um, and so, I mean, in textbook knowledge, you know, we know that that can impact it, but research lately has shown that it is a much more of a um, kind of aggravating factor than what we had even realized before. And so I think that that's really important to know that even if you've been doing, you know, research on this or, or kind of living with a chronic condition and you know a lot about it yourself, that there's just so much new information coming out every day. So um, that's one that I really became aware of this summer is dehydration can really, really impact your spine and your bone health. Poor sleep, uh, you know, everything is made worse when you're when you're sleepy. Um, I was talking um, with my mom, who's a nurse, yesterday about um, the class I was going to be teaching, and we were just conversing about, you know, her history of, you know, being a nurse for 40 years and taking care of patients. And she was like, we're always at our most vulnerable when we're hungry, when we're tired, and when we haven't slept. And she was like, when you've not had all three of those taken care of, then that's when you're most vulnerable for pain and when, um, you know, you're most vulnerable for just not having good mental health for that day. And so I think that's important. You know, we know that that's not life changing news. We know that and kind of instinctively, but um, it's important to think about, <laughs> am I having a bad day or aches and pains because I'm tired, because I'm dehydrated, um, because I haven't slept well? That that could be a huge factor. Um, poor sleep. Studies have shown that within a week or two weeks of having disrupted sleep, um, that you can start to have, um, you know, symptoms and exacerbations of like mental health issues like um, symptoms that would overlap with schizophrenia. There's been some studies that have shown that. And I say that because we don't think that sleep is going to impact our health that dramatically, but it can take a dramatic toll on our health in a very, very short amount of time. So I hope that that helps emphasize how much that our physical and our mental body, you know, it just, we it all works together and we have to take care of both the, the mind, the body, and the spirit. 
Things like cold, flu, and infections are going to definitely cause aches and pains because your body is trying to kind of form a response to be able to take better care of yourself, um, to be able to fight that foreign invader is what we always say in our, the textbook language because it knows that it, there's a bacteria, there's a virus, there's something in your body that it's trying to get rid of so that you can be healthy. Um, our bodies are always trying to protect us. It's always in survival mode. And so aches and pains are, are there because kind of the byproduct of the natural process of you know immune response, but it's also there to get your attention. And so um, what I have learned, there's no research to support this, I would, I would say, but what I've learned personally is that our pains, our symptoms get kind of what I would say louder and louder. Um, the more that we ignore them because our bodies are designed to take breaks and to rest. And the more that we ignore those, um, the more pain and symptoms we tend to have just to get our attention. Anemia, vitamin deficiencies like B and D, arthritis, autoimmune or chronic illnesses, injury or age-related concerns, and inflammation. Inflammation is a big one that we don't talk about a lot because we think about inflammation being acute kind of over a short amount of time. And we think about it being more localized, like if I were to leave here today and step off the curb and twist my ankle, that would be an acute inflammatory response. It would swell, it would probably get red, it would ache, and um, it would be localized to that, to that joint, that ankle. But we have so much more going on behind the scenes in our inflammatory responses. It can be more systemic uh, and it can be over a longer period of time. And we're exposed to a lot of things that cause inflammation. So seed oils and uh, soft drinks, processed foods, uh, you know, scents and fragrances that are in everything, chemicals that, um, you know, really burdened our system. So kind of the toxic effects of chemicals, um, smoking, e-cigarettes, uh, you know, Glade plug-ins or, or things like that. Anything that's going to cause the body to have to mount an immune response can cause that inflammation. I mean, you can even have what we call stealth pathogens, things like um, you know, latent viruses that kind of lurk in the background, like Epstein-Barr virus or, um, you know, things like parasites. And, you know, we often think about parasites not being something that we really struggle with in the U.S. or unless we travel. But um, a really well-known naturopathic doctor says if you have a pulse, you have a parasite. Um, I don't know that there's any factual information to support that, but there are stealth pathogens or things like mold exposure, um, food sensitivities, all of those things can also play a role in inflammation. So it's just important to be aware of that. I think some of these things can feel a little scary because you're thinking, oh my goodness, everywhere I go, I'm being exposed to something that could cause inflammation or an ache or a pain. Um, but just having the knowledge that you can be aware of these things. And then when you do have a sign or symptoms, those are just your red flags trying to get your attention to say, hey, pay attention to this because I'm trying to like help you address this issue in your body and in your health. So for diseases and root causes, it's so important to understand why you're developing diabetes or cancer or heart disease. Uh, cancer is on the rise, especially in young people today, um, especially, you know, young women and breast cancer that is becoming more and more prevalent. Um, young people, but particularly young men um, are having more diagnoses of colon cancer. Skin cancer is on the rise for both men and women. And I'm reporting these in men and women, male, female, because that's how it's reported in the studies. Um, but just know that there are some things hormonally that play a factor in and kind of lifestyle behaviors that would play, play a factor in why these are gendered, um, you know, responses. And of course, that's how we code them in research. But things like obesity, autoimmune diseases, fibromyalgia, arthritis, you want to look at the root causes. So it could be anything from immune imbalances, structural imbalances, inflammatory processes, hormonal disruptions, the toxic chemical exposure, digestive issues or imbalances, and then mitochondrial dysfunction. And I would also add to that, along with mitochondrial dysfunction, things like genetic predispositions or genetic um, variants. So we used to say genetic mutations a lot. And genetic variants is now the better term to use from what I'm seeing in the literature and what I'm hearing from colleagues. 
but genetic variants are things like the MTHFR gene variant. Um, I actually have that one, so if you know anything about that or have questions, I have a ton of information. I've been studying it for a while, and it definitely impacts your health because it impacts your ability to be able to methylate. So if you have a lot of symptoms, a lot of different types of health problems all across, you know, different body systems, it's sometimes really um, an interesting thing to look at gene variants because you're like, how can I have all of these health issues? And, um, you know, they all are seemingly unrelated. And it's all seemingly unrelated just because we don't have maybe the depth of knowledge to see how they're connected. And a lot of times it'll be something like a genetic variant that maybe you just don't know about. And that was true for me. Um, but there's a ton of other variants that we know about. Um, we just don't always talk about them as frequently as MTHFR. Um, but if you are interested in that, there's a book called uh, Dirty Genes, and it's a really good read by Dr. Ben Lynch, and he talks about the most common gene variants that we know about and have enough research on to make, um, you know, some some protocols and things to try to offset the uh, challenges that you can have with poor methylation. Uh, and he's a naturopathic doctor. I think that's always important to to point out education and and experience for context. So if you have a diagnosis or a disease or an ache or an illness or a pain that continues, is that persists, definitely see if you can find a root cause because then instead of just taking the Advil or the Tylenol, you can actually maybe um, dig up that root like you would in your garden if it's a weed. You can actually get it from the root and address that where you're not having to kind of medicate or band-aid it in the, in the kind of the end process. So that's always my preference and I'm sure it would be yours too. So I tell people to start with the wellness basics, whether you need to come to organize your life because you're overwhelmed or whether you um, need to do this because you're having some health issues or whether it's both. It's usually probably both because we're all struggling, I think, a little bit in some areas. We all could use improvement, myself included. Um, start with the wellness basics. If you're not sleeping well, if you're not staying hydrated, if you're not eating a healthy, you know, balanced diet, uh, if you're not moving your body every day, especially when you do work inside and you do sit more than you stand, you need to make sure that you're getting extra movement in. And then meditation or taking, you know, brain breaks, mindfulness, this could be prayer, but giving yourself some time to just step away and take some good breaks. Um, you know, three to five minutes per day is a good place to start, but hopefully you can work up to five to 15 minutes you know, three times a day. And then that would be a good place to really give yourself some space to rest. Um, so those are the wellness basics. We have a class on that for more information, but these are the things you need to be doing first and then kind of adding in some different um, interventions like maybe physical therapy, chiropractic care, checking in with your, your healthcare provider to make sure there's not an underlying cause you can, you know, make sure that you're attending to first. Those are the places you want to start. So definitely listed here for sleep, some good things about that. So making sure you're getting quality sleep, not just quantity of sleep. We always say, you know, sleep seven to eight hours, but sometimes you feel better with a good six or seven hours if it was good quality sleep versus, you know, eight to nine hours of, of sleep where, you know, your kid's waking you up or your dog is, you know, somehow on your bed or something like that. Um, you know, starting your routine the night before is really good. No blue light after nine. Keeping your room cool, dark, and quiet is always a good idea. And that's going to help you with your sleep. Um, not having the blue light exposure. Some people don't know what I'm talking about, but it's from TVs and devices and electronics that can alter how your body starts to go into its circadian rhythm. And being in bed by 10 helps because your body repairs itself on a schedule with that circadian rhythm and your sleep cycle. So if you're not getting in bed and getting good sleep before midnight, then you're missing out on the restorative sleep that you could be getting. So sleeping later in the day is not going to actually help that because your body is not on that repair cycle. So just a little bit of context behind why we say that. We have a power down hour. So we actually have our Alexa Echo Dot um, say power down hour, and that lets our kids and everyone but the dog know that it's time to go to bed. And so that's a really good reminder for people. Um, we have it at um, set to nine o'clock, and then that makes sure that if anyone is still up or lingering around, that they know to go to bed. We also turn the lights out after dinner. So by seven o'clock, it's lamps only, so we don't have overhead lights on. 
Um, that's not a rule, but that's just something we've always done, and it helps get people in the mood to go to sleep. Um, diffusing essential oils, um, taking a warm bath or shower, having dedicated pajamas. Um, there's so many things, a weighted blanket, sleep mask. Uh, there, there are so many things you could do for sleep, and I actually struggle with sleep a good bit. Um, and so do a couple of my family members. So I've dug deep into sleep research about how to best set yourself up for sleep. So if you have questions about that, feel free to ask. Hydration, so important that we hydrate. And not just that we're drinking water, but that we're drinking water that has electrolytes and minerals. So the rule of thumb is to drink half your body weight in ounces of water a day. So if you weigh 200 pounds, 100 ounces. Um, do the weight calculation, but usually no more than 128 ounces a day. Set reminders, track your progress, um, have it stack, carry your water bottle with you, make it fun, um, and then make sure that you understand that you don't want your urine to be completely clear, but you want it to be a pale yellow color, and that will definitely help, especially on hot July days like today. Nourishing your body, eating a balanced meal. I tell people to eat the rainbow. A lot of times we eat a lot of brown and beige food um, or white food, and those are going to be really carby. Um, they're going to be high in carbohydrates. They're going to be probably more um, deep fried or fattening. And then when we want to be healthy, we eat a lot of green. But if we're not eating the reds, the oranges, the yellows, the purples, um, you know, the blues, all of the different colors, then we're not getting those vital nutrients and antioxidants that each of those colors represents. So um, if you don't do anything else in terms of the nourishment category, uh, definitely think about making your plate more colorful. Including a protein, a complex carb, and a healthy fat at every meal is really important. And so um, making sure that the three of those are on your plate or your snack for meals and, um, you know, throughout the day, that's going to help regulate your blood sugar. A lot of times people can have anxiety or anger if um, they get a dip or a, a spike in their blood sugar. So, you know, thankfully we have the word hangry to let us know that. Uh, you know, but that's something we all um, sometimes face, but a lot of us more than others. Um, so this morning we were trying to have a really important conversation in our household. And I had to say, I did not sleep well last night. The dog woke me up jumping on my feet this morning, which was a little unexpected. And I have not eaten. So let me finish my breakfast and then we'll talk about this really important thing. Um, and then, you know, of course, the kids are like, mom's hangry. And I'm like, mom, mom needs some nourishment. I need some protein before we talk about this. Um, so it's definitely OK to let yourself be human. Um, but let your people know that. Let your colleagues, let your kids, let your you know family members, your friends know so that um, when you are a little irritable or anxious, you know, they can say, have you eaten anything? So that's a that's a common thing to ask a couple of us at the Horton household. Have you eaten? Because you seem like you need to eat. Um, track your meals in your snack with a food journal or an app. I think that's really important. I love to tell people, especially who are wanting to lose weight, to take a picture of their food. So not just writing down what they ate because um, a hamburger that's gourmet and made at uh, local roots, for example, is going to look different than a hamburger that you would get like at a fast food restaurant. So saying that you ate a hamburger and telling your dietitian or your health coach or somebody like that who's holding you accountable, oh, well, I ate a burger, um, you know, that is going to mean something different to to everybody because your favorite burger is not going to be my favorite burger. So taking a picture of what you're eating so you can see portion sizes, so you can kind of see the quality of the food, and then taking any notes that you think would be helpful is really, really important, not only to your health, but also if you're trying to lose weight, which a lot of people have that as a goal. And then just make one healthy change at a time. The more that you have to change, the less you're actually kind of have the margin and bandwidth to change. So that's a common principle in health coaching is, um, you know, the more that needs to change, the less you have the capacity to do anything about it because you're just so overwhelmed. So, um, you know, the more weight that you need to lose, for example, the less weight you probably, you know, can really tolerate losing. You need to take it really, really slowly, one pound at a time, two pounds at a time. So I hope that helps you. Moving your body every day. This is really fun. Yoga, Pilates, walking, dancing, stretching. Um, all of those things feel more accessible than things like hardcore HIIT workouts, Orange Theory, CrossFit, 
um, running, all of those things are great. And if you love them, do them. But if you just move your body in a fun, meaningful way, more than what you do for your traditional, you know, getting up every day and, and doing your work in your life, that's helpful. 30 to 40 minutes, four to five times a week is pretty standard. Um, or 150 minutes of exercise, moderate exercise a week, that's going to be really beneficial to your overall health, but especially your cardiovascular health. You know, we say cardio is important, but cardio is heart health. So we shorten that to say we're going to do a cardio workout, which a lot of us don't love. I don't love cardio either, um, but it's it's heart health and our heart's just a fancy muscle. So set realistic goals, um, start small. If you're not exercising at all, then, you know, put five or 10 minutes as your goal for exercise, and then just go and walk, a brisk walk. You don't have to, you know, walk really, really fast. You don't have to speed walk. Just do a brisk walk where you realize you're walking a little bit faster than you normally would. One of the apps that I love and that Miranda actually introduced me to is the Fit On app. They have a paid membership that's around $40 for the premium, but the basic is free and it is amazing. I have tried so many different apps over the years. I've gone to all the fancy classes, the fancy gym memberships, um, because I was on a weight loss journey and lost 85 pounds over the last couple of years. And so I tried it all. And the Fit On app, I think, is the best uh, value for, you know, for, for nothing. I only just have the free membership. They have meditation. They have a blog style articles that you can go and read more information. And in my personal opinion, their information that they share in their blog style articles and emails are very, very good. They're very well researched and they're very cutting edge. So would highly recommend that one. If you don't do anything else, drink more water and go download that app. Um, but this is really going to be helpful for movement. They have exercises that you can do and you can pick it based on the level of intensity or the you know amount of time that you have. If you want to work a certain you know body group, upper body, lower body, um, you can pick by your favorite instructor. It's just really, really, really well done. And I'm so excited that Miranda shared that one with me. You also can create groups and friends connections like you can in our MoveSpring app, which I also use and recommend. Um, so that's a MoveSpring challenges that we talk about are done in an app that's very similar and creates a community here at UA. So we would love for you to download that one. And then meditation. Um, some people are not, um, you know, really embracing a meditation. So you can name this something else. This can be brain breaks or self-care, but just taking time to just disconnect for a few minutes. No Outlook email notifications in the background. You know, no phone calls ringing. You know, turn your volume down for a few minutes. Do this at home. Take all of your notifications off of your phone, except for maybe your text messages and your calls. All your other apps, if they're not truly essential, turn the notifications off. All of my notifications have been off for years, and it's one of the best things I've ever done. I have tried to make my phone as unfun as it can be because it's pretty fun when you have all your favorite apps. Um, but take those good breaks, close your eyes, and just rest for a few minutes. Try not to overthink because that really burns through the calories and our brains use about 25% of our daily caloric intake. So the more we overthink, the more we ruminate on things or stress, the more that we're kind of, you know, running out of, of our energy or our reserves in our brain. Um, try to be present in the moment. So I always tell people, be present where your feet are. I have to tell people that because I need to hear it too. That's something that I'm very future oriented. So I'm always thinking about the next five steps ahead instead of where I am right now. And then being mindful of distractions, like I mentioned, some of the tips I listed really are to help you not be distracted. Um, so things like using the Pomodoro technique or app where you can turn a timer on and kind of race against the time can be really helpful in terms of eliminating distractions and letting you hyper focus for a little bit to get work done. And then bonus tip is to laugh every day. My son Charlie would say to hug every day. There's some research that shows if you hug at least 12 times a day that that really helps with your good neurotransmitters and that um, it helps you be a healthier person, just a happier person. So laughing, hugging, showing gratitude. Those are all great practices in terms of self-care. And those are all things that you can do that's going to help your physical body. Um, a lot of times the things that we are struggling with in terms of aches and pains are not really truly a physical origin. It's it's stress. It's overwork. It's 
not sleeping enough. Um, and if it is from an accident or injury, all of those things that I just mentioned are going to aggravate or exacerbate the symptoms we're having. Um, because if we go back to the example of the the ankle, if I were to you know, sprain my ankle today, if I have a, um, an emotional reaction about that of, oh no, I was going to go um, you know, skiing this weekend, I cannot ski. <laughs> if I was gonna go skiing with my friends this weekend, um, on the lake and now I've sprained my ankle and I can't do it and I'm so upset and you know now I've ruined my weekend and I'm in pain if I have that kind of response as I'm trying to actually heal the sprained ankle itself that's going to make it more challenging and I'm probably going to experience more physical pain truly more physical pain than if I'm like oh my goodness well this is such a con inconvenience and such a typical thing for Abby to do um, oh, well, I'm just going to prop my foot up and go sit on the boat and enjoy my friends anyway. Um, that's going to be two very different outcomes in terms of your mental and your physical health. And so think about how you would react or are you somewhere in between? So things like turmeric, omega-6, fish oils, um, gentle exercise, especially stretching in the morning, stretching, maybe doing desk stretches and exercises, Carolyn McVicker does a phenomenal job of sharing those kinds of desk exercises you can do at work. The Fit On app actually has some exercises that you can do specifically at work if you don't have any kind of equipment around. So you can set a timer and every hour get up and walk, go refill your water, get up and stretch. That's going to be really helpful. Um, and then some plant-based diet options. If you're having a lot of issues with inflammation and just not feeling great, just kind of feeling sluggish, even if for like ethical reasons or dietary reasons, you don't need to be a vegan or a vegetarian or pescatarian or, um, you know, any of those kind of um, categories, keto, all of that, the more that you can give your body a break from digesting food, um, kind of the better. So that's why it's good to kind of cook your vegetables, eat warm foods, um, you know, be strategic about the water you're drinking because sometimes drinking too much water before a meal can actually um, kind of slow down your metabolism because you're, you know, affecting your stomach acids and enzymes. But just being very strategic about the choices that you make and not putting a lot of stress on your body to digest food. Um, during some of my, you know, surgeries and different acute illnesses and things, I've done a lot of juicing. Um, that's not sustainable for me to do every day. I don't think it's recommended for most people. But, you know, juicing um, a green juice and doing that at home to save money and to also know what's in your juice, um, that has been really helpful for me so that I'm not skipping out on nutrients and vitamins, but I'm getting it in a way that my body can process it easier. That's something that I really personally enjoy doing. And then reducing your stress, because like I said, that stress response is going to send out adrenaline and cortisol, and it's going to impact your hormones and your neurotransmitters. So having that stress response to that ache or pain or that accident or injury is going to just exaggerate the pain. And it's not your mind making it up. Your body is actually making the pain worse because it's trying to say, hey, I need you to take care of me. And this hurts. Do something. And pain is the way that gets our attention, unfortunately. Um, sugar, refined carbs, seed oils, alcohol consumption, um, eating meat three times a day is usually not the best idea for most people. Um, processed and fried fruits, just because, again, the seed oils, but also the additives and preservatives. And then trans fats um, are actually um, human-made chemicals, and so they are more like the preservatives and things. And so you really want to see that your trans fats are at zero when you look at your food labels. And I think we need to start looking at our nutrition labels, not just for calories, because when I went to places like Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig as a teenager, and I started my first diet at 12 years old um, because I was overweight and my doctor, my pediatrician felt like I needed to lose weight and be kind of, you know, proactive with that. So that started my diet history at, at 11, 12 years old. I was only taught to look at the calories. I didn't look at any of the other things like the vitamins, the minerals, the um, nutrients that were there. I didn't really look at the fat or protein and the other macronutrients or the chemicals that were on the label. It was just calories only. Um, and we know that uh, 100 calories of M&Ms are going to be very different than 100 calories of cooked vegetables. Um, so yes, it's calories in and calories out in terms of weight loss sometimes, but if we're having an inflammatory process, 
there's more to the story. It's not just a simple math equation or we would all be our ideal body weight, in my opinion. So trans fats, you want to see those at zero. So other things that you can try, stretching, like I mentioned, deep breathing is so important. Um, I had a surgery. A lot of you have attended my classes before. I had a surgery back in um, March of this year. And when I went to physical therapy, my very first exercise was actually diaphragmatic breathing. Um, and I said, why are we doing diaphragmatic breathing when I'm here for physical therapy because of my my abdominal core is, is weak from surgery? And, um, you know, I can't, you know, I felt like that that I would had really, you know, started at the basics. I was like, walk me through the mindset of this. And so I learned a lot more information about deep breathing and the purpose of being able to reset your um, pain response and um, how important it is to be able to relax those muscles, um, to be able to strengthen those muscles first. So kind of the tightness versus um, the weakness, they go hand in hand. So I asked a lot of questions to be able to to pass this on to y'all and so that I would name myself. Um, we learn a lot in nursing school, but we don't learn all of these nuances. So dental exercise, so things like the walking, the Pilates, the the yoga, those are going to be a little bit gentler on your on your body and your joints. And um, Epsom salts baths, that gives you a lot of good magnesium. So make sure that you get a good clean brand. But taking Epsom salts baths at night um, is something that I really enjoy and recommend. Um, it's not contraindicated for most people. But if you have a question about these things, definitely reach out to your healthcare provider. Aromatherapy, I love to use essential oils. Just make sure that they're medical grade. Um, and most aromatherapists do not recommend that you ingest them. I know that some brands do recommend that. And you do what you feel comfortable with. But um, just having the uh, aromatherapy either applied topically on your skin or having it diffused um, is always going to be better than using things like um, candles or other fragrances or scentsies or wax melts and things like that because they have so many chemicals in those um, wicks and in those candles themselves and they're not made to be therapeutic they're not the plant extract which is what the medical grade essential oils would be massage therapy you know we talk about going and getting a massage but so many people leave off the word therapy um, massage is not just a spa experience it is actually therapy because you're manipulating manipulating that um, muscle tissue and the fascia and um, you know in the skin and so massage can be very therapeutic especially if you're having a lot of aches and pains if you are let them know the area point to it on your body and tell them what's happening and, you know, kind of the history of the ache and pain, because a lot of times the massage therapist can make recommendations for you even beyond massage. Um, but then they can really take a, a kind of individualized approach to massage for you so that you get the best benefit. Things like cryotherapy, so that cold chamber that you can use, um, to really lower the body temperature that has been seen to be effective in lowering inflammation for people. You also will see things like um, the cold plunges or the cold showers. They'll say, you know, to fill up a bathtub with water and some ice to get it to like 50 degrees or, you know, lower, usually 40 to 50 degrees um, or end your shower with, you know, with finishing with cold water because that's going to help close up your skin pores. It's going to help you with inflammation. All of that's really, really popular in combination with infrared sauna, which helps with the detox process of sweating. Anytime you're crying, you're sweating, you're um, having, you know, you're in what we call voided or you're having bowel movements. Those are always, you know, even like when you're sneezing and snotting, all of those things are ways to get, um, you know, things that are not supposed to stay in your body out of your body. Um, so crying can be therapeutic too. Uh, infrared sauna is really helpful because it uses infrared lights in addition to heat and it's more of a dry heat that people tend to tolerate a little easier than like the hot wet humid saunas that are kind of more traditional acupressure and acupuncture we have a couple of places in town that will do this and um, a couple of naturopathic practices and then also some chiropractors who are certified to do this work um, I have had it done and it has helped a lot with my shoulder injury um, that I think I mentioned to you earlier 
If not, I had a shoulder injury years and years ago. And sometimes I have a little bit of pain and stiffness in that, almost like a frozen shoulder. Um, but physical therapy, uh, chiropractic care, acupuncture has been really helpful, uh, you know, after that initial injury so that I never had to have surgery. So you just then after the acute period have to work on strengthening that muscle so that you don't lose your muscle function or what we call atrophy. And so um, sometimes our aches and pains are because we had an injury and then we never went back to try to strengthen the thing that that was injured. So think about that if you have you know, if you're having this dull pain somewhere, have you had a previous injury that maybe you didn't really recover from? Um, and then outdoor time or what people call forest bathing. <laughs> I think that's a fun one. Um, some people actually say grounding too. If you're taking your shoes off and walking in the grass, I don't know how many of you like going to the beach, but um, when you put your feet in the sand, that is one of the highest forms of grounding because of the uh, ion transfer, and there's a whole lot of, of information and research there about how grounding helps with your body. And that's certainly not in that area of expertise, but I do know that I feel better when I walk barefoot and when I put my feet in the grass and when I put my feet in the sand or I put my feet in natural bodies of water. Um, and there's something about that grounding effect. So being out around nature under trees, I have a good friend that does research on green space. And um, he told me at a conference recently that if you st spend 21 minutes outside, 21 to 22 minutes outside, especially like under a canopy of trees. So not just that you're on green grass, which is what I thought green space was, um, but it's that you're under and near and around trees and you walk and you're outside, you're getting good sunshine. If you take someone that you really like or that you love, someone who's, um, you know, helpful to you that you enjoy spending time in their company if you do that that is like the trifecta of having good health and wellness because you're getting sunshine you're outside you're grounding you're getting outdoor time under the trees and then you're having connections and relationships which um, has been found to be one of the most meaningful factors in long-term health is having meaningful lasting relationships so and connection human connection is so important so Everyone grab a friend or a loved one and go walk under some trees this weekend, get some good sunshine, and let us know. Report back if you think that was helpful. About 22 minutes. Other things, the OTCs, um, you know, so the over-the-counter medications, the aspirins, the Tylenols, the pain creams. Um, you know, you have things like Ben Gay, but then you also have some other ones that are really, really helpful. Um, the gel-type creams. Um, TENS units that you sometimes will see at um, the chiropractic or physical therapy offices. I really enjoy those. You can buy your own um, at almost any pharmacy or big box store. Hot and cold therapy. Usually you want to, within about 24 hours of the injury, do heat um, to help with like the pain and the inflammation and the acute injury. And then after about 24 hours, of course, this depends on the injury itself. And then you want to switch to cold therapy because if you keep applying heat, you will actually keep continuing and prolonging the inflammatory response. And most of us, myself included, prefer heat, but you actually may be prolonging the healing process by continuing to like lay on the heating pad or to take hot baths and showers. You need to switch to cold therapy, which is usually like ice packs. Um, and of course, you have to be careful about applying too much hot or cold to your skin. You want to make sure you're protecting your skin. You might need to put down like a tea towel or something and then a bag of ice or, um, you know, the frozen piece from the, the freezer or, you know, a gel pack or something like that. But definitely um, consider and ask good questions um, for whoever is helping you with your, your accident, your in injury, your surgery. But usually after 24 hours, switch to cold therapy. So hot, then cold. And then kinesiology taping can be really helpful, especially if you, it's a joint mobility issue or joint laxity issue. Maybe you're a runner or a walker, but um, you've had uh, an issue with like a torn meniscus or, um, you know, you've had a, a you know pulled muscle in the past. Having that kinesiology taping, which most chiropractic 
offices or physical therapy offices can do for you could really help, especially if you're going to be in a 5K or you're, you know, you've got a busy weekend, you could go and get a service and then get that taping and that could really help support your joint. You just don't want to overdo it because the more you support a joint, the more that the joint wants you to support it. <laughs> so, um, you know, the old adage is if you don't use it, you lose it. Um, you just want to do those in those instances where you need a little extra support and you're going to have a little extra um, strain on the the muscle, the joint, because then that can be helpful. But if you are relying on it for too much, then your body is going to get used to it and kind of adapt and need that. Uh, red light laser therapy is also helpful. Uh, again, PT, chiropractic offices, um, wellness centers will have laser therapy, and that can really help a lot with scar tissue. Um, another thing that I haven't listed here is if you're having aches and pains because of old scar tissue, that has been the most helpful thing for me going to physical therapy. I'm still in physical therapy um, and having the scar massage with Palmer's oil. Um, you just take that enough to cover a couple of fingers, two or three fingers. And you take the first three fingers and you do scar massage across it and down, um, depending on the type of scar you have. Someone like a physical therapist could tell you or your surgeon um, if it's appropriate. Of course, you have to wait until everything is healed and closed and, um, you know, and you can tolerate having some pressure. But surgeons that I have worked with and my personal surgeons have said the, you know, once you're cleared to do this, the more that you can do your scar massage, the more that that scar is going to fade, the less scar tissue you're going to have underneath that forms and it's going to restructure that um, scar tissue. So they, they think of it kind of like a matrix. So if it looks like this, it's kind of gnarly. If you can do scar massage, you can make that cellular matrix underneath the skin look more like this um, because you need that scar tissue to hold everything together. You're not trying to eliminate the scar tissue. You're just trying to make that scar tissue lay flatter and to stretch more. Because a lot of the pain that we have sometimes when we have scars and old um, surgical incisions is that the, it is gnarly. And so when you go to pull or bend or lift and something feels like it's pulling or it's stretching or it's tearing, it is probably micro tears in that scar tissue. And that's a huge issue for me because I've had a lot of abdominal surgeries. Um, we also have things like halo therapy. Everything I've listed are things that you can do in Tuscaloosa. So there are other things that you can do in bigger cities that have more resources, but I've tried to list the things that you can do locally um, or even in Birmingham. Halo therapy is going to be salt therapy. So there's a couple of places that you can do salt therapy here in Tuscaloosa. And usually it's about a 10 minute session. And that really helps a lot with your lungs and with your respiratory health. Um, even allergies and immune system responses. So when my husband had COVID and had a lot of constant indications and complications with the meds and, and with his healing process, um, one of the things that we did that worked really, really well for him is he did some sessions once he was past the acute um, infectious stage and he was cleared, he went and did halo therapy several times and that really helped with his lungs and his respiratory health. So there's so many different ways you can use these therapies. I included some pictures here because I'm a visual person and I think that always helps tell the story. Um, so things like stretching, I'll kind of go across cryotherapy, uh, turmeric and ginger tea, grounding outside in the sunshine, which is crisscross applesauce, massage, aromatherapy, infrared sauna, acupressure mats, which I really, really love. I have one and I use it a lot. Um, it's definitely an acquired taste. It's a little painful. Um, it's not super painful, but it's a little painful when you first start um, because it has a lotus shape and it has some points on there. Um, I ordered mine from Amazon, but there are a ton of companies you can get them from. Acupuncture, Epsom salt baths, cupping, along with um, people who provide acupressure or acupuncture, usually they offer cupping too. I have had that done and it does make those big circles on your back. So those stay around for a little while. You're going to have circular bruises, but that's supposed to help bring blood flow to um, the body. And I really found it helpful for my shoulder. Um, grounding outside when you see the gentleman staring off at the trees, you've got turmeric underneath that picture, getting outside and walking. I'm doing some functional uh, exercises. I always like weightlifting as part of your program for fitness if you're able. And it doesn't have to be heavy weights. Right now, I'm using one-pound weights. I'm starting over. I was doing 
you know, 15 and 20 and 30 pound weights before my surgery. And I'm restarting with one pound weights because that's where I am. So I hope that encourages you just to start where you are and use what you have. Um, and then lemon water is also really, really helpful for hydration and for detoxing um, your liver and your kidneys like like water, like lemon. Um, Biofreeze is another great option for um, an, a substitute to Bengay. I like it a lot. PT and chiropractic offices use those all the time. You've got the heating pad down below it. You've got the halo therapy. Um, you've got this gentleman here doing some um, some foam rolling, which can be really helpful in addition to stretching before you exercise to prevent injury. So stretch, warm up those muscles, do some foam rolling either before and maybe after. Um, you've got gua sha in, with a lady with the, the pink stone and roller that helps with lymph drainage. Lymph massage is really, really good. Red light, sunshine, laser therapy. You've got the TENS unit, the kinesiology taping below that, the hot and cold packs. Um, I didn't mention rebounding, but having a, a little mini trampoline, you could even do this on your kid's trampoline, um, but rebounding, there's a lot of good videos about how you do that. That can really help with the length and with strengthening your bones and your muscles. That's good for things like bone density and osteoporosis. You've got some exercises to reduce lower back pain because back pain is the most common type of ache and pain in the U.S. Um, treadmill, you don't have to run. You can walk and that works just as well. And then some chiropractic adjustment below that. And so that is what I had to share with you. Always treat what I share as a menu. So pick one thing and try that. And if that doesn't work, um, then try something else. Give it some time, though. The first time you try something, is you're probably not going to fall in love with it. It's probably not going to be something that miraculously makes things better. Um, so give it a little bit. Give it a few days. If you're trying a new therapy, if you're um, trying a new product, ask the therapist, ask the product maker, when should I see results? Um, and as long as you're not in pain, it's not causing any kind of issues, then kind of give it that time period to see, okay, do I feel better? If not, then try something else. Um, and at different times in your life, you know, you're going to have to try different things. Different types of injuries and pains are going to require different treatments. And so there's no formula or protocol, unfortunately, but you just have to try and see, okay, what right now is the most helpful? But having those good tools and resources is where you need to start kind of having that awareness um, because it's not just, you know, over the counter pain medication and a heating pad, which is kind of our go to. So I'm going to open it up for questions and answers, um, but this is our social media. So please follow us on our website, Facebook, Instagram, and the blog. Uh, the work life wellness team do an amazing job of all of that behind the scenes. And Miranda is usually our behind the scenes person here for these classes. So thanks for all that you do, Miranda. And then this is my information. So if you need anything there, you can reach out. And I want to make sure that there's no other. That was the last slide. So I'm going to leave that there, but I'm going to actually drag over my screen so I can be looking more toward y'all. So y'all are going to see my chat, but I want to see what all you may have asked about. Okay. All right. Good. I'm glad you enjoyed the information. Can you get an annual check of the faculty staff clinic? Yes, you absolutely can. And they do a wonderful job. They have two, I believe, nurse practitioners right now, and then they collaborate with one of the physicians and at the University Medical Center. And you can walk in, no appointment needed, and they take great, great care of you. I have been there many times um, when I needed to be seen right away. So yeah, that's a great one. You can definitely go there. Having some joint issues. Oh, having some issues joint, I got bumped off. Okay, sorry about that, Laura. For arthritis pain, what do you suggest? I think any of the things that I mentioned are helpful depending on the type of uh, the type of arthritis that you have and um, when you were diagnosed versus, you know, juvenile versus adult. Um, do you have psoriatic arthritis versus um, rheumatoid arthritis? There are going to be a lot of different recommendations, but I think in terms of pain management, pain um, medicine, you can do anti-inflammatories over the counter. If your healthcare provider, um, you know, approves of that, there are definitely stronger prescription medications that you can take. Um, in nursing, we like to do the least invasive thing first, and so I always like to try over-the-counter um, hot and cold therapy, stretching, um, 
resting. Rest is really important with arthritis. Um, so those are some things that I would try first and then work with your healthcare provider. You can even see um, some specialists, you know, sometimes rheumatologists will be able to help you. I was actually diagnosed um, with psoriatic arthritis as a 11, 12 year old. And so uh, I have very little pain today and actually don't qualify for the diagnosis anymore. Although I sometimes still have the symptoms of it when the barometric pressure drops or when um, it's very um, hot or very cold outside, I still will have a good bit of joint and muscular pain. You can have some muscular pain because the joints will pull on the muscles. So that's not uncommon, but a lot of people don't talk about that. So you can also do some things for muscle relief. So yes, you will have access to the slides after today. And Jessica, I hope that answered your question. If not, let me know. Um, yeah, thank you for dropping in the UMC information. Is it better to get your exercise throughout the day or 30 to 60 minutes at the gym after work? I think it's whatever works best for you. So people are going to always tell you it's best to exercise in the morning. And there are a couple of different reasons. Um, in Chinese medicine, and if there's anybody an expert in this, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and in Ayurvedic medicine, they want you to have um, your exercise done before usually 9 or 10 a.m. Because that's when you're trying to, you know, gear up for the day. If you have a traditional work day, this doesn't work if, like me, you used to work night shift as a nurse. But, um, you know, they're thinking about a traditional work day, the traditional, you know, getting up with the sun and going to bed with the sun. Um, then they want you to do it in the morning. And some people like productivity health trainers want you to do it in the morning because they say eat the frog first, you know, do the thing that you're dreading most. And for a lot of us, that's exercise. And so that you know that you've had a win for the day and you, you know, you can get it done. My personal philosophy is you have to do it when it works best for you and that doing it is better than doing it perfectly. And so if you need to do 30 minutes in the morning and 30 minutes in the afternoon, I think that is much better than not doing it at all. Um, so certain seasons of life, it might be that you can get up and do 60 minutes before work. And in other seasons, it might be that you just have to do 30 minutes after work. And I think all of that is always better than nothing. So I hope that helps, Lisa. I think sometimes we try, um, as health professionals, I think we try to be too prescriptive about you have to do it this way. And some things are like that. Um, but with health and wellness, almost always doing something is better than, than doing nothing. Thank you, Brandy. Oh, thank you, Miranda, for putting the fit on app in. Did you say I had? Yes, I have MTHFR. I have the um, C677T um, homozygous variant of the MTHFR gene, Nancy. And I'm happy to answer more questions about that if y'all have questions. Jesse, I do not know about that in terms of therapeutic phlebotomy at UMC, but I do know that you might can check at DCH Cancer Treatment Center. Um, with part of the methylation issues that I have with this gene variant is that I have a lot of issues with ferritin and vitamin D and my anemia, all of that being low. So I sometimes have to get um, IVs for hydration and I sometimes have to go and get at the Cancer Treatment Center iron infusions and so they probably would be more equipped to do the therapeutic phlebotomy um, if not they can do that in Birmingham so definitely try DCH cancer treatment first I would say and if not then maybe UAB next and if not they should be able to tell you who does that there also may be some um, home health services. Sometimes they'll have centers where you can go in at the home health agencies and you can do it there. So they may have a good resource. Nancy, what doctor do I see for my MTHFR? I don't see anyone to manage that, but if you're interested in that and in terms of having it managed, um, you could go to the UAB Hospital Genetics Center and get a referral there. Um, and they can do genetic counseling with you there and they can recommend who would be best to manage that right now. Most people, unless it's just genetics consults, don't actually manage it through a specialized doctor. They manage it through naturopathic doctors and your family provider, which is what I do. Let me know if that helps, Nancy. But UAB is our nearest genetic center. But your regular doctor, your rather regular healthcare provider can order the test because it can be done at LabCorp. 
you just have to make this case for why you want it. Y'all, I know that we're at our time, but I'm happy to stay on. Y'all are always the highlight of my week. I love getting to talk and teach wellness. So if you have to go, I understand you get your credit. Um, Miranda can track your attendance, so no worries about that. But I'm happy to stay on and answer questions. I've been diagnosed with MTH. Right, could you suggest therapy options? I would start with Dr. Lynch's, Dr. Ben Lynch's book, Dirty Genes. Start there, and then you're going to go down kind of a rabbit hole of, of practices and things that you can do. Um, for me personally, the thing that has been, and I'm not recommending this because I'm not an expert, but the thing that has been the most beneficial for me is to cut out folic acid um, out of processed foods, enriched foods. So I try not to eat those. Now you are going to see me eating Chick-fil-A, and it's enriched. Um, but I try to be very strategic about how much folic acid I take in, and I use folate instead because folic acid has to be converted through multiple steps where folate is readily available and so it doesn't take your resources for methylation there's a you could write a dissertation on methylation and folic acid um, but folate is going to be the more bioavailable and the better option but folic acid is cheaper so that's what's in all of the enriched foods so shopping the perimeter of the store is going to be really helpful for most people, not just people with that gene. Tiffany, I'm so glad that was helpful. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all so much. If you don't have any other questions, I wish you a good day and go schedule that walk with your friend under the trees in the sunshine this weekend. And let me know that you did it. Y'all can email me and tell me. And Miranda, I'm committing. You're going to be my accountability buddy. I'm going to do it and I'm going to text you and tell you that I did it. I'm going to send you a picture. Okay, I'll keep my out for that. Okay, by Sunday, I will do that, Miranda. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Carla says, this has been helpful. Thanks for your commitment. Absolutely. This is my passion is to help people be empowered to take ownership of their health. That's how we're going to change the healthcare system, y'all. All right. Thank you all so, so much. I hope you all have a good rest of your day. Bye, guys.